Hello and welcome to Ignite Elam Church Online. We're so glad that you can join us today. And today we're going to go into the second part of our series, The House of Prayer. And we're going to look at the purpose of prayer, why we pray and why it's so important. We're going to do this by looking at Jesus and why someone who had all power and all authority still chose to pray on a regular basis. I hope that you're blessed by the next half an hour or so and I will see you at the end. Oh, there's no place I'd rather be. Oh man, I'm just so excited for God today. It's so exciting that we can all, hello, hello everyone. It's so exciting that we can all gather together, you know, to meet with God, to be in his presence, right? I mean, who knows that God is in the room today right now? Did you know that God is here? You know that God is here, yeah? Liam, yeah. do you know that God is here right now? Yes? yes. Awesome. So if you setting up cameras, do you guys know that God is here today? Awesome. Oh man, it is so exciting to be in a place where God can be with us, right? And, and that can happen anywhere, but, but there's something about gathering all together, about worshiping together, about raising him up together, that's just, whoo, just brings God into the room, you know? Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man, I'm so excited to be in the presence of God right now. Yeah. Come on, church. Oh, I am so ready to, to see what God does today. Oh, whoo. Oh, man, right. Oh man, I'm, I'm excited. I, I just I just know I oh mate, I just know God is in the room right now and oh, oh how good is that we can serve a God that can be here with us, amongst us, and so eager to encounter us. So I if I'm completely honest, this is the third version of my preach because um I wrote I wrote one this week and then yesterday I was reading the Bible and God said actually um I want you to preach about something slightly different, um, still the same chapter, but just the first half rather than the second half. And then I got here this morning and God said, actually, I want you to take a bit of a different angle on the second version again. So this is the third version of the preach and it's, you know, not as refined as the first, but I feel like this is what God wants to say today. So I'm really expecting that this is given off heat. I'm um, it's really hot as it is. I'm just going to turn this around. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I'm getting so sweaty today. It's great. Um, so, this is the second week that I'm going to dive into this series uh, that, that we're starting. It's, uh, it's the House of Prayer. And it's based on, uh, based on Matthew 21, 13. My house will be called a house of prayer. All right? And a little bit of a recap for people who might have not seen last month's preach. We preach that, well, first of all, what, is, what, what does this mean? It means that, you know, if you, like, like I said last month, if you go into a water park and the slides are there and, uh, and you get the wristband saying that you're at the water park, but there's no water, it's not a water park, is it? Right? If you go into a fire, sta- into, into, into a fire station where, you know, you, you expect all the firemen to be there, but there's no fire engines, it's not really a fire station, is it? And in the same way, if we walk into a church, if we walk into a place that is meant to be the house of God and there is no prayer, then it's not the house of God. Because the Bible tells us that the house of God will be called a house of prayer. So that's number one. If we want to be a house of prayer, then we need to have prayer. <laughs> um, oh, is that a fan? I thought there were headphones. Oh, man. I think we all need to get one of them, yeah. Um, and then we kind of dived a little deeper about what, how, how, can, how can prayer work in our lives and, and what, what actually is the authority that we're given as the church in prayer, right? And, and we ended up uh, concluding uh, through, through, specifically we looked at Isaiah and um, oh, who was the guy? Nehemiah? Nehemiah, yes. Uh, Isaiah and Nehemiah, when Isaiah comes to Nehemiah and says, God is saying you're going to die. And Nehemiah turns around and goes, was, was it Nehemiah? It was. Huh? Hezekiah. Hezekiah. That's the one. Hezekiah. That's the right. Um, yeah, he comes to Hezekiah and says, and Isaiah says, you're going to die. And Hezekiah, instead of saying, well, God said I'm going to die, I'm going to take a step back. Instead, Hezekiah steps up and says, God, please spare my life. And through prayer, he changes the outcome of a situation. A situation that has already, by all means necessary, been written down in heaven. God himself said this is the outcome, and Isaiah and 
uh, he prays and it changes. Then we see in the story of Peter, right, when he is spared and freed from jail, when the people of God pray, right? And we ask ourselves the question, if, if the church didn't pray for Peter, would he have been released from prison? Maybe, but the Bible doesn't show us that scenario. It shows a scenario where they did pray. And so again, we see that as the church, we're able to release the power of God into certain situations. And I did specify, let's remember that it's not us giving God permission to act. It's us only being part of God working, right? We, didn't, we made that very clear that we don't give God permission to act because he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But we, God wants us to be part of what's going on. And so sometimes when we pray, we release God's power over things. And sometimes, even when God does want to act, he won't because, for, because the church doesn't step in. The church doesn't call God's name. And so God doesn't force himself into situations. Now, we spoke about, you know, being bold in prayer, praying bold, boldly, right? Praying for things and, and, and actually, you know, being brave in the things we ask for. But I want to talk about today about things that maybe sometimes when we pray don't come to fruition. You know, even when we say that bold prayer and it doesn't happen or, 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 or there's a promise in the Bible, you know, that God will do this and, and, and prosper in that way or, or be your peace. And then we see that those promises aren't fulfilled. And so I want to talk a little bit about the purpose of prayer. And by extension, why sometimes prayers aren't answered. And um, I think the, the, the best example, the best thing we can look into when we want to find out the purpose of prayer is to look into why did Jesus pray? Why did Jesus pray? Right? Because we know that Jesus, whilst having a human body, was still God. He had all authority. He had all power. Right? Right? He didn't need to pray for miracles to happen necessarily because he'd just speak things and say, hey, stand up and walk, right? He, did, it was, he wasn't like us. He didn't need to pray to God to receive some power because he already had power. He already had authority to the fullest and at his fingertips to use whenever he pleased. And so why did Jesus pray? If it wasn't to receive this authority, to receive this power, why did he pray? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus says that he doesn't do anything that the Father doesn't tell him to do, right? There's nothing that he does that the Father doesn't tell him to do first. And I want to suggest the reason that Jesus prayed wasn't to receive power or to, 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 to kind of be filled up again with authority or something like that. He prayed for no other reason than to be in constant relationship with the Father, in constant relationship with the Father. That is the purpose of prayer. It wasn't for Jesus to come and ask for things. It wasn't for him to, to come and make requests, but it was there so that he can communicate with his Father. And that's the first, number one thing that we should, te that we should take from Jesus praying. That prayer, the purpose of prayer, is the primary purpose of it, the main focus of it should be relationship with the Father, and all things should be secondary. And um, let's have a look here. So I want to ask us today, as we sit here, and, you know, we don't have to answer out loud, and because we don't have to answer out loud, we can answer honestly, right? Because no one else hears apart from ourselves. So let's be honest, okay? When we pray, do we pray seeking solutions, seeking um, God to interfere in certain things, or do we pray first and foremost to get closer to the Father? Let's be completely honest. And, 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 and there is no shame in saying, actually, I do come here to God for solutions because I feel like all of us, myself included, we fall into this trap a lot of the time where actually we come and we pray solely to ask 
ask for things and say, God, can you, can you, can you do this or do that? Or, or God, I, I'm, I'm going through this and we vent to him. And there's no shame in that because it happens. It, it, we all fall into it a lot of the time. But we need to be honest and realize when that is happening. And realize when, when building our relationship with the Father and seeking him and seeking his voice and seeking who he is over us is no longer the priority. You know, the Bible does say about using the word as, as a mirror, right? To, to look at the word and, and see whether, what kind of reflection comes back. And, and this is one of those cases we need to be honest and say, what is our prayer life? What is it about? What is the purpose of our prayer life? Because, you know, I feel like a lot of the time we can go into prayer and we can come out feeling drained. We can come out feeling maybe disappointed or, or not expectant. Because we go in and we just, you know, we, we, we ask for this, we ask for that. And, and actually we end up venting about the problems in our life and we end up coming out more tired than what we went in. Because we focus so much on the negative and we focus so much on us rather than focusing on the one that gives life. I want to read, it's a, little, it's a, bit, a bit of a long one. But I want to read from Matthew 6. Matthew 6, uh, and I'm going to read from uh, verses 25 through to uh, 33. And I encourage, if you have a Bible, do follow. Because, you know, got to make sure that you guys keep me accountable here, like I say. Right? So I don't preach anything silly. I don't say anything silly. Uh, Matthew 6. Uh, and then verses 25, and I'm going to read through to 33. Got it? Awesome. Okay. For this reason, I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. So this is holy stuff right here. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. As to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor what for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky. What do, uh, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single day to your lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon, Sir Solomon, in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the, bur into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Ugh. Do not worry then, saying, what are we to eat? Or what are we to drink? Or what, what, what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all those things. For you, seek those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now listen to this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. I'll finish the chapter. So do not worry uh, about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be provided to you. So does that mean that we have to stop worrying about everything in life and you know, pretend like life is okay and it'll, it'll all be fine? No, that's not what this is saying. Because, because if, if, if we're honest here, the reason these people are worrying about what they will eat, what they will drink, what they will clothe is because there's an actual need there. There is a need for food. There is a need for clothes. And God isn't saying that those aren't real problems. But what he is saying is, I love you. So seek first my kingdom. Seek first my righteousness. 
Seek first a relationship with me and all else will be given to you. All else will be given to you. Again, a lot of the time we, we worry about these things and these are the things we pray to God about, you know, food and clothing and water. But God is saying, hey, seek me first. Seek a relationship with me first because what was the purpose of, of entering this relationship? Why did you first come to me? God says, why did you first come into relationship with me? Why did you first accept me into your life? Was it because you saw me as someone that can, you know, answer your, 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 your like, because I'm some sort of wishing well, maybe? No. Let's be honest here. The first time we ever encountered Jesus, it was because we saw him for how glorious he is, for how amazing he is. And we wanted him in our lives because we knew that we need him. And somewhere along the line, we sometimes wander away from that. We wander away from it being relationship-centered to being requests-centered. So how does this dynamic work of, you know, there's... Things in my life that need sorting. But here it says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. How, how does that dynamic work? And, and um, I think we can see a pretty good example of that. In, uh, and I'm going to skip now all the way back to the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And it's a bit of a chunk. So I'm going to explain it and then I'm going to read the last bits of it. So what happens in, uh, in, kind of in that kind of little bit of section of Kings? And the previous chapters. And this is probably one of the coolest stories, in my opinion, in the Bible. You can disagree, um, but you will be wrong. Um, but, um, of course, it's involving Elijah. Because, once again, Elijah, probably one of the coolest prophets. Um, involving Elijah. And at this point, what has happened is the Israelites have walked away from, the, from, from God. Have walked away and started worshipping other gods. And started, and started focusing about on, on their own kind of problems and the way they want to worship and the way they want to live life. And so they walk away from God. And as a result, a, 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 a drought comes along. There's a drought in the land for three years. For three years, there's a drought. Man, I'm sweating. <laughs> it's hot in here, isn't it? It's like a drought in here, isn't it? Oh, man. So the Israelites walk away from God, and a drought comes into the land. And, and in, 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 in this time, the, the, the prophets of God are being killed off. They're, be, they're being attacked and, and killed. Um, and, but Elijah kind of gets away, and, and he is alive. And Elijah, finally, after three years, appears and, and comes to, uh, to, to the king and, uh, and says... Bring me all the prophets of Baal and all the prophets of Ash Asherah, right? And so the king gathers all the prophets of these, of these, of these idols on, uh, on Mount Caramel, I believe. And, I, and, I, and uh, I'm going to get Isaiah and Elijah mixed up because I preached about Isaiah last week. Um, Elijah turns around and says, this is enough. This is enough. You have driven out the Lord from this land. You have slaughtered his prophets. Let's have a showdown. Bring me two oxes, and your prophets can choose one of them. I'm not bothered. They choose the one they want. Build an altar, carve up the oxen how they want for sacrifice, and then pray to your God to bring down fire and consume the altar. And if your God answers, then he's real. If my God answers, then my God's real. And so, and so the prophets of Baal build up this altar and they, and, they, and, they, and they put the ox on there and they start doing their rituals, you know, and, and, you know, let's just put some context on this. These weren't just some prophets, right? Part of their rituals was harming themselves, mutilating their bodies, punishing themselves for, this, for, for, for the sake of their God because that's how they believed they get their God's attention. 
That's how, that's how sick the, the worship of Baal was. And that is why God hated it so much. So when we get to the next part, you're not shocked about what happens. I'm just giving you some context here that these, these, this was horrible what was happening here. And there was 450 of them and 400 of our, that worshipped other gods. So about 850 prophets all doing this sick ritual, trying to call down fire from this idol. And Isaiah kind of sits back and it, it's about a day that's gone by and he kind of sits back and goes, go on lads, shout a bit louder. Maybe he's asleep. And the best thing is, that's literally what the Bible says. He says to him, maybe he's asleep, shout a bit louder. Maybe he's busy doing something else. Go on, shout a bit louder. Finally, about, after about a day, they give up and go, go on then. Call to your gods. Let's see what happens. So Elijah builds up his altar, puts the ox on it. Then he goes, get me buckets of water and douse it in water. So they do it. Then he goes, get all those buckets, go back, get more water, douse it again. And he does this three times. Three times he puts water all over this altar till it's soaking wet. Now, we're not even talking here about, you know, calling God to bring fire down. Try and light that thing just with a lighter, right? Not happening. Elijah then calls out to God. And God sends down fire from heaven and consumes not just the ox, but the altar and even the stones that were used. But how hot must have that fire been that God sent down? Now, do you remember that drought I mentioned a little earlier? That was there because God was kind of pushed out. Well, after this, as you can imagine, the people of Israel turn around and say, oh, okay, the Lord is real. We have forgotten him and we've messed up. And we want God, we want you back as our king. We want you back as our Lord. And so what happens next? I'm going to read to you and uh, I'm going to read... Uh, where is it? 1 Kings 18, and I'm just going to read uh, verses 40 and 41. But I do encourage you to read that whole story. It is crazy. Um, there we go, 40 and 41. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. Now, Elijah said to Ahab, which is the king of Israel, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. Three years of drought, not a cloud in the sky at this point. Elijah goes and kills all the prophets of Baal, and then says, Now, all go back home, eat and drink, because I can hear the sound of rain coming, like thunder. I believe there's two things we can get from this. There's two things we can get from this. Number one, clearly there's a problem here. There's a drought. There's there's, 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 there's a need that needs fulfilling. There's, 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 there's starvation and, and people need God to interfere in this situation. What's the first step? The people restore God to his rightful place. That's the number one thing. Now, the question is, did God let them starve and, and the drought be there because, because he's hateful and spiteful because they rejected him? No. Because we know the area of land that they lived in. We know that the climates change and, and, and things happen without even God interfering, right? I want to tell you that the drought wasn't there because God hated them and sent the drought on them. It's because they said, God, we don't need you to provide rain anymore. We don't need you to provide food. We don't need you to, to make this climate livable anymore. Because we rather do it ourselves. We rather solve these problems ourselves. We don't need to worship you so that you can provide for us. So it wasn't like God came down and said, now you're all going to suffer for this. God just said, fine. 
I will step back and I will stop providing because you said you don't want me to. You said you don't want me to be part of this. You don't want to be in relationship with me. And so the first step to the drought going away, the first step to this problem being solved was God being restored to his rightful place in Israel. And I want to say to us today, if there are things in our life that feel a little bit dry and that, that we just need God to interfere in, the Bible says, hey, if you seek first the kingdom of God, if you seek first my righteousness, everything else will be given to you. Not because I'm trying to buy you, not because I'm trying to bargain with you, but because, because I've created you to be in relationship with me, because I've created you to be close with me. And, and, and if I'm to treat you like part of my, as, 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 as my, as my children and, and bless you as I do my own, then let me be your father. And when you have a relationship with, with a parent, it doesn't necessarily have to be a father. You can, you know, you can be a mother, you, you can be a brother or a sister, right? But it's just about relationship, right? When we see, when, when, when we see those relationships in everyday life, for those relationships to be strong, there needs to be that communication. There needs to be that priority that actually before anything else, we are family and we seek each other. That's why God says, seek first the kingdom of God. And so I want to say today, number one, if there's something that, is there a part of that your life where there's a drought that God needs to interfere in? And you know, sometimes life just happens. Let's just make that clear, right? Sometimes life just happens. But I feel like a lot of the time it's about, is Jesus truly in the rightful place in your life? If you had to be completely honest, and again, like I said, we're not speaking this out loud. It's all in, we're all saying it to ourselves so we can be brutally honest. If we draw out a list of priorities, is our relationship with the Father at the very top? Because it wasn't until God came back into his rightful place that, that Elijah prayed for rain. So that's number one. I'm not going to, you know, carry, carry on mulling over it. We get it, right? Number one priority, get our priorities straight. God needs to be number one, right? Everything else will be given to you if you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. Number two, and, and this is, so I, I was originally going to preach from verse 41 onwards about Elijah calling down the rain. But I think I'll leave that on to next month. If you want to cheat and get ahead, then you can read that. Um, but that was going to talk about. But I still want to mention it because God, because Elijah goes on top of the mountain and he says, I can hear the sound of the rain coming. I can hear it now. I can hear it. The, 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 the sound, the thundering of the rain that's about to come is so loud that I'm, you need to go back home because you're not going to make it if it starts pouring down right now. And so we see that once we get our priorities straight, once God is in the rightful place, suddenly the ground starts to shake a little bit because now the king of our life isn't our problems. There I say no longer... And again, it's easier said than done, but no longer is anxiety the number one thing in our life. No longer is our suffering the number one thing in our life. The thing that we come to God about every single week, every single day when we pray to him and ask him for this thing, no longer is that number one in our life. But now, number one is the Father. Now, getting to just be in his presence becomes the priority. And when, and, when, and, when, and when the number one thing in your life becomes the almighty God, the creator of the universe, the one who created you for a purpose to be in relationship with him, to walk in his authority, to, 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 to be overwhelmed by his presence all the time, when he becomes number one in your life, that is when the ground becomes, starts to shake. That is when suddenly 
after three years of drought, you can hear the thundering of rain coming close. So that is, that's point number one. God restored. When he's number one, everything starts falling into place. Because the scripture doesn't lie. The word is the truth. Right? Can we all agree on that? Yeah? The word is the truth. And so when it says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything will be given to you, it has to be the truth. I'm glad we agree. Now let's make sure we live it. Number two. I think this is an important one. And sometimes it can be quite hard to see it or or give an answer to to it if God isn't number one. If or if 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 we're not actually seeking his voice. And I think this is quite important is what we're asking for when we pray. Will it bring God glory? If God heals us. You know, let's say, for example, uh, again, let's go back to that random imaginary guy I made up last, last month. My leg snaps, and it's an anti-degree angle, not this way, but that way, right? I snap my leg, and I can't walk. And I pray to God, God, heal me. If he heals me, does that mean I'm going to go back and start getting into fights? Does that mean I'm going to go back and, and start clubbing every day? Does that mean I'm going to go start going to places I'm not supposed to be going to? Right? If, if, if God gives me money, and let's say I don't even know how to buy food this week, and God gives me money, will that money be splashed on alcohol? Will it be splashed on things I'm not supposed to really be putting into my body? Or will it bring God glory? Will I be able to go and say, God has blessed me with money and I've been able to feed myself this week? So, and then these are extreme examples here, right? But if God answers your prayer, will he receive the glory that he's supposed to out of it? When he blesses you, will, will you be able to go out and say, God has done this for me? And it wasn't through my own strength. You know, if, if God gives you that promotion at work, Will you go around and say, I've earned it? Or will you say, I've been praying for that promotion for so long and I couldn't got it through all those years of trying, but I prayed and God gave it to me. Will he receive the glory? So, now the question we might ask ourselves, and I'm coming to a close. So, I know it's hot. I know everyone wants to go to bed. Um, but I'm coming to a close and I'm actually coming to a close this week not like last time when I said I'm coming to a close and went on for another 10 minutes Um, so now that you know we say that let's first restore God to his rightful place and let's first of all get into a place where we know that what we pray for will bring God glory does that mean now that we should take a step back from asking for things until until we're holy does that mean we have to stop asking and, and, and come into our own Father and, and say, God, can you help me with this until we're completely holy? No. And I want to read, this is the last bit of scripture that I've got prepared. I'm going to jump right back to Matthew. And we're going from, we're no longer in chapter 6, we're now in chapter 7. And I'm going to read chapter 7, verse 7 uh, to 11. This is literally a couple verses after what we've just read, right? Seek first the kingdom of God. But it also says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or... Or what person is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not, he, uh, if, he asks, if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? So, if you, despite being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him. 
right? So, look, God knows that we're only human. God knows that we struggle. He knows that there's problems in our lives. And God knows the issues that we have, even before we come to him. He knows all about them. He knows about how much money's in your bank account. He knows about the status of your health. He knows about the relationships you have. He knows about the family members that aren't saved yet. He knows those things. And so, there's two things here. First of all, God is saying, seek my kingdom first. Seek me first. Why? Not because I demand some sort of, so, so, some, some sort of, like, you know, like dictatorship, you need to look at me first, number one, although because he is sovereign, he deserves it. He'll never force you into it. But because he loves you, he wants that relationship. Because he loves you, he wants to be close. And because he loves you, he will never force you to be closer to him than you want to be. But he says, when I am number one, when we are that close, then, then we're, we've got that relationship where now you can, you can say things and, and, and I'm going to start answering because now, and again, you don't have to be totally holy and perfect in everything you do. But God is urging us to make sure that when we pray, when we pray, when we think, what am I praying about? Let's make sure that it's first of all about him. He is the priority. He is the reason we pray. Because, let's put it this way, we all have met people who will be friends with us or will hang around with us purely because they want something. Purely because they want something out of us. And God's not silly. He sees that. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we that person that is only sticking around because we want something? Are we only sticking around because, because we can get something out of him? Because we want something out of him? Or are we actually here for a relationship? And if your answer is, maybe I've fallen into a trap of just asking for things all the time, it's not because you're a bad person. As human beings, we have a tendency of focusing on ourselves a lot of the time. And if you realize it, and like the Bible says, get up and repent and sin no more. And we're cool. And so when you identify that you've maybe fallen to the trap of making it about yourself a little bit, let's repent of that. Let's say, God, actually, I've noticed that I've started doing this, and I want to say that I'm sorry. And God says, and sin no more, which means now that we've got that behind us, let's get back into this relationship. Let's get back into being close. And, and you know what? Now that you've realized that you've been doing this, it's, it's cool. You can still ask for help. You can still come to me and, and say, God, I need you to help me with this. I need, I need this problem solved. But let's make sure that our relationship comes first. Let's make sure that when you come and pray, the first thing you do is say, hi, God. How are you? And that relationship comes first before we start listing off a, a thing of demands and, you know, throwing a one pound coin into the well makes to hope our wish comes true. Right? We can still ask for things and still, still, you know, treat him like the father he is because he does want to help. He does want to bless you. But let's make sure that our relationship with God remains number one priority. And so all that this preach has been about is just reminding us of the purpose of prayer. That the reason Jesus prayed is because he valued his relationship with the Father so much that he couldn't go a day without just talking to him. He just didn't need anything from him. He had all the power, he had all the authority, but he just wanted to spend time with his Father. And so that is the purpose of prayer. And that's what we need to remember when we pray. That it's all about him. So we're going to go into a moment of worship. And do you guys want to stand with me as we go into this moment of worship? I know it's hot 
and we all probably just want to chill out now. But you know what? It's okay. I'm all right to sweat for Jesus a little bit. As we go into this moment of worship, let's do some introspection, which means looking inward. And let's be honest. And don't beat yourself up for anything. Don't, don't attack yourself for anything because God won't. But just be honest. And if you want, just say to God, I'm sorry. So that's, if you want to pray with me, I, I'm going to do it as well because I fall into that trap as well. So I'm going to pray that prayer. And if you want to join me in it, then feel free. And then we're going to go into a song of worship. Father, I, uh, I know that I sometimes stray away. Sometimes when I come to you, I have a tendency of making it all about myself. But God, I want to just apologize for that. I want to apologize for making it about myself all the time. I know that you see my problems. I know that you see my struggles. And so I just want to come back to a place where I'm putting you first. Lord, I want to invite you to the number one spot in my life again. And I want to ask you that you, you aid me, you help me in making you my priority every single day. And I promise that I will try my best to do that too. Thank you, Jesus, for being so patient with me. <laughs> It is so important that we are aware of what the purpose of prayer is and that we make sure that our hearts are in the right place. If you've heard this message today and you have noticed that maybe recently you have slipped into making prayer about yourself more so than your relationship with God, then why don't you make a fresh commitment with us to make a conscious effort to put Jesus and your relationship with him at the center of prayer and to make it about him rather than about ourselves. If you enjoyed this message, then I encourage you to press subscribe and press the notification button so that you can keep up to date when we upload and you can hear more of our messages. And if you enjoyed, then do press the like button and I'll see you next time.